no role plays, just real. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. We've never really, as a workforce, spent a lot of time on making sure we're developing good leaders. We'll be able to share stories, experience, mistakes, uh, failures, successes. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, on this episode, I want to address another listener question that we got via email a couple days ago. And it's something that we've talked about briefly before, but I don't think we've really focused on it. And that's the the concept of the differences between what happens as a leader when you inherit a team that needs a lot of work versus when you inherit a team that is already performing really well. And so, I mean, I, I'm sure, I, I know I can speak for myself, when I've inherited both types. I've, I've been promoted to lead teams where there was a lot of work needed and I promoted to lead teams that were already doing really well. What have you done in, in your career in regard to this? And did you act differently or was it different for you? Definitely different. Uh, I will start it off with that. I think in, in most instances, people will talk about the fact that it's much easier to take over, you know, what they would consider to be a, you know, a broken store, a broken business, or maybe a dysfunctional team. Because at that point, you know, many times whatever output or results they're driving are typically, you know, minimal or there's a lot of room for improvement just because the foundational elements of the team are just not functioning well right um versus the idea of maintenance and or following you know um uh, somebody who uh was a leader in a business that either maybe got promoted or got moved and that type of thing um so I, i've definitely seen both i've walked into environments where Either the output and the results were not there and they were looking for a leader to help, you know, improve the culture and the environment to then, you know, increase those things. And I've been and I've walked into environments where the results were actually good. Um, what I've discovered, though, in, in many instances is even in a team where the results that you're looking at on the surface are doing really well, um, there's, a, there's typically a lot of work to be done within the team itself. Um, the trick is that you don't want to go backwards then and have to go forwards. Like I think that's really what becomes very difficult is as a leader walking in, you really have to be conscious of what you're doing to not completely dismantle a high-performing team or at least a team that's, that's outputting good results um, to then have to try to bring them down to bring them back up again. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I agree – about what one is harder than the other. I think if you're a leader and and you believe that taking over a a team that needs a ton of work is easier or or more desirable than taking over a high performing team, I think that I mean I'm I'm sorry to generalize here. I think that might be a little bit of a sign of laziness or or a lack of confidence or 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 high ego because if you're taking over a team that is not performing well, what you're essentially saying is, okay, I got you know three to six months where people are going to leave me alone because it's already terrible. I can't make this any worse, so I'll do what I can. And even just basic stuff is going to see some incremental improvement. Uh, maybe they hated the leader on the way out, so they'll give me a chance to start. You know, I, I just think it's it's all these things that you know the, it's the it's the low hanging fruit guy, you know, and and I've I think taking over a team that is already performing well is easier but that's because i feel like i don't have a hard time allowing a team to run without me and i i don't know i feel like the the the, the, the you need to be more hands on and i like working with people who want that sense of independence I'm okay with not being the person who has all the answers and letting people get there on their own. And so I've always enjoyed taking over teams that were high performing and kind of letting the culture take me in as opposed to trying to to change that. Changing culture can be really fulfilling, um, but there's only so many times you can do that without it you know, kind of draining you out, I think. I, I, I like work, working with high performance teams. I think the kicker is this, though. That's working under the assumption that the previous leader – uh, was one that was allowing there to be empowerment and the team to run the business and things like that. Uh, many times you can walk into a quote-unquote high-performing team with the results, but the leader was micromanaging. The leader did not give them freedom to make decisions. The leader was very directive. That's true. Um, Correlation does not equal causation. <laughs> that's correct, right. Yeah. So it's not necessarily either way. It's, it's not where either maybe low results or bad output 
or you know good results or good output is reflective of the team. Um, most of the time, it's going to be reflective of the leader, but it also means that maybe the leader wasn't leading in the way that was creating a great culture or a great environment. So like, there's a lot of dynamics to unpack there. Sure. Uh, and, and I also think it's also uh, the influence of industry. You know, like what, what industry are you in? What type of business are you in? Because if that industry or business measures your success in the short term, if you're looking at you know, monthly, quarterly, half six, you know, six month goals. Um, sometimes you don't have a lot of time, and that that's where it can be tricky to not have a negative impact on the business while doing some of the work that you need to do. Um, where you don't have the ability to necessarily like just kind of walk in and coast and see what happens. I I think though what you brought up around the culture piece, you know, my my immediate thoughts on this are this is a great example of where the culture acronym is really, really important, and it being the first C, which is consider yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're walking into a high-performing team um, that is doing really, really well, you have to think about, you know, how do you need to lead them? What are the dynamics, right? Who who was the previous leader? Um, was this a team that you were already on, now you're elevated into a role where you're now, you know, the, the main leader, or are you coming in as an outsider? But these are the things that, that you really have to take the time to think about so that you can show up in a space that allows them to have the continuous cadence of what they're normally used to doing while also thinking about how can you maybe address the things that do need to be addressed um, without shaking the boat too much. And, and you know what? I, I've also, to share in full transparency, I've walked into to, to places where the performance was right, but they were doing it the wrong way. Um, where, where their output was good, but integrity was being questioned, you know? So, so having to go into that environment and say like, Hey, I'm following up on a high performing team to then find out that in fact they're high performing because maybe they're not being as honest as they should be, or maybe they're working the system. Um, then you kind of have to, you do have to pull back. You do have to restructure. You do have to reset expectations. And that can definitely have a negative impact on the business. And that's not very fun. No, it's not very fun. And I'll, I'll tell you something else. In those situations, that's when sometimes you get to test your metal as a leader when it comes to ethics. Because I've been in situations and I've witnessed situations where what you describe exactly happens and the, the work that the leader takes in order to take a few steps back and say, okay, you all have the talent to do this, but we're going to do it the right way instead of the wrong way. That's when you start getting pushed back by people above you who left that team alone because they wanted the plausible deniability of saying, we just like these results. We're not going to lift the rug up because once we see they're doing it the wrong way, we got to do something. So we'd rather not know to begin with. And, and you and you start to get the pushback when they all they see is the numbers are dropping and they say, well, what's going on here? And then you say, well, this is what's going on here. We were getting these results the wrong way. So we got to take a, a couple of steps back and relearn how to do this the right way. You start getting people who are like, well, Let's uh, let's see if we can do it while still maintaining those those numbers or, or, or whatever it looks like the, the kind of the veiled um, encouragement. And I, I have seen leaders go both ways. I've seen leaders stand up and say, there's going to be a period of retraction here, but I'm confident that over the long term we can get there and and been told, all right, let's see what you can do. And I've seen leaders not have the courage to say that and they fall in line and they, and they continue doing things the wrong way. And you know what? They may be able to get away with it for another year or two years until they move on and get promoted and and because they maintain those numbers or, or made them better or whatnot. I, I just I can't see that being fulfilling long term from from a personal standpoint of feeling like you accomplished anything. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And I think that it's a you know, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic. And I think it really, you know, it, it's a tough spot to be in, especially like if this is the first time that you're maybe leading at that level. So like I, I think it's specifically into retail, you know, if you're going into uh, a store as a general manager or, you know, the, the the head person in charge of that location, that can be really difficult if it's your first time doing this because you, you the, the temptation is normally, I want to put my name on this. This is my first, you know, real responsibility of, of having a team or a store. This is, this is what I've always envisioned. My way is, is going to be the best way, no matter what's going on here. There's all these things that can happen that will immediately have an impact on the culture and on the environment. And it's rare that somebody 
in that space is comfortable enough with how they lead to understand that they've kind of got to balance that as they go. I don't think, I mean, I could, there's, I'm sure there's exceptions to this, but I was going to say, I don't think the people who go into those spots and they immediately try to put their name on things and their stamp on things. I don't think they're doing it largely because of ego. I think the people who get promoted to these teams largely get promoted because they're seen as, as a positive influence as a leader and that they could take on a, a bigger team. So I think it's more of, of a sense of trying to validate their own existence or justify their own existence. They don't want to be have that first call with their boss after two weeks or after a month or whatever it is and and have to say, yeah, you know, I, I really haven't done much. I, I've had some cool conversations with people, but the team is so high performing that uh, I didn't really have to change much. It, it doesn't sound inherently good on paper to say basically you put somebody in here and I could have stayed home. And that's not what they're saying. It, it takes a tremendous amount of leadership talent to say, I can do no positive here, so I don't want to do harm either. I'm just going to let this high-performing team do what they do well and and watch them do it and then give them accolades. That takes a lot of confidence as a leader to do that. And I think a lot of leaders have a hard time, A, doing it, or B, articulating that that's what's going on to their own boss. Yeah, or just sitting back and understanding that they've got to get a read on the situation. Again, it's very different if you are a part of a team and you get promoted in that same team because you kind of, you got the inside scoop, you know what's going on, you, you, you know how the team performs. Maybe you've got some, you know, people that you worked with that you don't like that, you know, you, you now have the title and can have some, some different influence over. Um, but I think in the space of coming in as a leader into that type of an environment, you're right. It takes a lot of, of understanding who you are, how you lead, the dynamics of culture, the dynamics of environment, to just be able to sit back and see and watch and then you know, utilize the opportunity to learn from your team to better understand what's actually going on with the team and how they are getting the results they're getting and then having the quick assessment to realize, okay, are they down the right path and I can show up as a different version of myself and be able to offer them support um, that they're used to but also with a little bit of a spin to it um, or are they – you know, have they been misled, mismanaged? They they they're doing these things the wrong way, and now I have to figure out a way um, to create a strategy that will allow us to get back to where we should be going without taking on all the noise of a lack of the performance that's already been happening there. Um, I, I think that 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 really does speak to uh, to really good leaders who are capable of doing that and being able to put their own ego to the side. Um, instead of walking in and being like, I'm going to have this impact. I mean, look, look, I, I remember my first leadership meeting, right, when I first became a GM many, many, many years ago. And just like the feeling of like, here it is. I've got this team now. I, I have my theories, right? I have the things that I want to be able to do. And like, I remember to this day doing our culture acronym on a whiteboard in a break room with my new team as a new GM was uh, to talk about culture, to talk about how I wanted to function as their general manager. And these are the things that I was going to do. And I wanted to get their thoughts and feedback on it. Like I remember that clear as day because like that's what you're thinking of when you finally get that job. And and thankfully, you know, I, I was going into a team that was doing well. Um, the team themselves, uh, for the most part, were leaders that were very open to you know to, to thoughts. They 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 wanted to do good work. They wanted to understand. So you know, I was able to navigate the vast majority of that team um, as a new leader uh, by by being able to provide them with my thoughts, but also include them in the strategies and the dialogue. And we had a lot of good success. Um, and it and it was a really really good time. But I I can think you know that clearly with that. A situation because I believe other new leaders would feel the same exact way and want to be able to walk in and have their way of doing things. And in a situation like this, like I said, it, it can be dangerous. Yeah, I, I re I'm really glad you gave that example because the first thing I was going to say was around inheriting a team when they, they don't know your score. They don't know who you are. You didn't get promoted from within. You took over the team and they don't know you well. And I like that you gave that example of the first time you became a GM because that's exactly what that was. And I think the importance of making sure that you eliminate some of the apprehension of, of these people not knowing what to expect. So you'll, you'll get people on the team that you inherited and the guy or girl that you replaced 
they either liked that person or they didn't like that person, but they knew that person. They knew what to expect from that person. And sometimes, even if you don't like a leader and you might be happy that they left, the new person coming in, there there might be some 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 happiness there that you get to you get somebody new, but there is definitely some apprehension over. Oh my gosh, is this person going to be worse than the person before me? Or or it's I, you don't know what to expect yet. So it's it's super important that while you are taking time to take a step back and not try to put your name and your stamp of approval on anything, you are not so stepped back that your team ends up living in apprehension for 30 or 60 or 90 days because they don't know who you are. Um, there, there's a difference between trying to trying to impact strategy and trying to impact the implementation of strategy versus you know not, not having a presence at all um, except ones that are solicited. There needs to be unsolicited conversation between you and your new team, even if you're not trying to tell them how to do work. Yeah, the, what makes it even more fun is when that previous leader is still there and now reports to you as an assistant manager. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause you know, it, that just, is, again, it's challenging. And I think that, you know, to your point, you, you've got to be able to, you know, provide a level of leadership um, that allows them to understand who you are as a leader, what you stand for and what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but also, you know, being respectful of the work that they are doing and being able to walk in and congratulate them on the results they've gotten and talk about, you know, you wanting to understand and learn uh, what it is that they're doing and how you can best support them to continue the work that they have going on, uh, while at the same time figuring out ways to fill gaps and provide a different level of leadership. And I think that that really truly becomes kind of the definition of, of servant leadership is, you know, how do you want me to show up that allows us to continue and grow on the work that's already being done um, while also being able to find ways to add value um, and accelerate the team dynamic and the development of the, of the organization. Right, totally. The Anytime you can pay homage or honor the positive work that has been done going in, you give them comfort in that you're not trying to dismantle stuff, that you're here to to do what you can to help them with their development but that you're not trying to take away from from everything that, that they've accomplished before you even got there. And with that, it brings us to this episode's One Minute Hack. The One Minute Hack. All right, so for this episode's One Minute Hack, here's what I'd like for you to do. If you find yourself taking over a team that is high performing, so the output, the results are such that they are ahead of the organization or they are achieving and exceeding the goals that have been given to them, here's what I want you to do. Get out your pen and paper and on one side write should and on the other side write shouldn't. And underneath those words, I want you to do three things as you're thinking about how you implement yourself into this team. So here's the things that you should be doing. Number one, you should be spending time with the team to get to know them and taking every opportunity to let them know who you are. The second thing you need to write down is finding ways to call out the work they accomplished without you. Again, this is what you should be doing. Making sure that they feel recognized, that they understand that you know the work they have done has been good work and that you're not taking credit for anything that's already been there. And then the third thing that you should be doing is validating processes to make sure they're being achieved the right way. As we mentioned earlier on the show, uh, you can have output and great results, but they could be done the wrong way. So you need to spend some time making sure that in fact they're doing things the right way. On the other side of the page, under the shouldn't things, you shouldn't be invisible. You should not be just showing up at work, spending time with only a few people and not being accessible to the new team that you're leading. You shouldn't be trying to implement your own strategy in the first 90 days. Now, if there's company strategy or changes or things that you're responsible for making sure are implemented, yes, you should do those things and make sure you explain that these are the company's expectations, but nothing that's from you directly that you feel is your own stamp of what you're trying to get the team to accomplish. And the third thing that you shouldn't be doing is questioning processes and behaviors in public. If you, if you're, if you want to figure out what's going on or you're unsure of something, Find that with other leaders that you have or people that you can speak to offline, but be very conscious of making sure that you are not questioning everything that's that's happening in front of the team when you have not yet had the chance to meet them and, and build a, a great trustful relationship. I think it's a fantastic one minute hack. I love that those are very, very tangible things to do and not do. Uh, I think if you're a leader 
and you're inheriting this the, a, a high performing team and you do these things, I, I don't think I, I don't see how you can go wrong. Um, this is a this is a time for you to get to know them while they're getting to know you. And what you're basically doing is removing a lot of the anxiety and apprehension that comes with getting a new leader. And if that's all you do during the first 60 or 90 days, I think it's a win. Yep, I completely agree. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time.